Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I want to give a special thank you to each and every one of my patrons. You really do make a difference, so thank you. If you're interested in finding out more about Patreon or what I'm talking about, wait till the end of the video, or check the description. But anyway, without further ado, it's time for you all to get very comfortable and let the darkness take control. I want to start off by saying that I am someone who suffers from an overactive imagination. I tend to see things that are just not there, or being sensitive to certain noises. I tend to think this is due to me having Asperger's and move on, but this was entirely different. I live on the top floor of an apartment that I rent from my family where I live by myself. It's nice to receive the independence that I yearned for, and it helped me come out of my shell by getting me back into exercise, cooking, and genuinely going out and about with my day with a wider and happier stride. I've always loved horror, as well as tabletop games, although I am a self-professed coward and tend to make a good impression with people I meet thanks to years of growing, therapy, and helping me find myself. I moved into this apartment in the winter of 2007, and when moving, I noticed that the apartments opposite were empty. I spoke to my parents, who said they never saw who used to live there, but whoever it was soon moved out and were never seen from again only to be visited by bailiffs, which have since stopped. The place has already made me uncomfortable, as I had to face away from that door to unlock mine. The lock on my door was broken for a while, meaning I had to be very specific with how I unlocked it, or the key would end up being jammed. I would always feel eyes burning at the back of my neck, looking behind me only to see the same white door, my eyes leading up to the peephole. I remember once staring at that peephole for a whole five minutes, looking for any subtle changes in light. I'm quite a big guy, 250 pounds at six foot one, but there was a feeling that made me feel like I was six years old again. Each time I passed that door to number 13, I could swear that I heard noises coming from within. Footsteps, quiet arguing, and even the door jiggling. Each time something like that happened, I felt my soul dying just a little bit more. I soon caught myself unlocking my door and entering my safe haven to get lost in books, video games, and other stuff. At my job, I tend to work later sometimes if I need to speak to a team in America, or if I just cannot face waking up early. I work for a large firm as an analyst, although I wouldn't want to get into much detail regarding that, and since it was bang in the middle of winter, it would tend to get dark at around 4.30 to 5. I would walk down the public driveway and look up to my apartment but only to notice that the blinds next door were shut. I don't remember if they were always shut, as I never focused on it, but it immediately felt off, as if you were looking at a puzzle, only to notice in the right centre that a piece was missing. I climbed the stairs leading up to my door, lost in thoughts, because I was having a particularly bad time at work during then. I was staring at the steps in front of me, before I found myself on the same landing. But this time, something felt off. I could smell something was off. I immediately thought it was just rubbish from downstairs, and that was yet to be collected. But there was something different. The air felt heavier, almost colder, as I approached the door. There was a smell of rotting meat that I had never noticed before. I knelt down by the door, letting my backpack to the side as I leaned against the door. 
It was from there. There was a smell. My mind raced, as I could not immediately pin what on earth was causing it. I laid on my front and tried to look under the gap, only to immediately start gagging, almost vomiting as I keeled back. I gripped the carpet rolling away and knocking over a couple of things as I clenched my fists. It was the smell of death. Have you ever smelt a dead animal? A fox on the side of a path that is rotting. You can see its ribs slightly poking out as maggots writhe and squirm in the decaying flesh. It was that smell. I stared through the gap, only to be met by pitch black. I could have sworn that I saw something pushed to the side, but I didn't want to stay there any longer, and I darted up and retreated inside, calling my dad to tell him about it. It wasn't too long after that, perhaps a day or so, when I heard that the building manager had went into the property, and that was it. Nothing else was said about it. No one else could tell me what happened, or they did not want to. I thought I saw a look in my dad's eyes when I questioned him, and all it beckoned me to do was to shut up, and accept that sometimes answers just don't give you closure. I never knew what happened behind that door, nor would I ever wish to know. I don't know if my mind is playing tricks on me, when I get a nasty shiver race down my spine, whenever I look at the painted oak door, treating whatever was there as a gentle facade, much like how some wear a mask to hide what is behind their own eyes. I sometimes swear I can still smell it whatever it was. I sometimes think that someone was dead, but I don't think I will ever know or want to know. Back when I was in college, about seven years ago, I had to move from an apartment to another last minute. Because, well, I was a lazy college student and hadn't made any other plans. My parents were in town, so we were looking for something quick. Luckily, we found something pretty cheap and somewhat nice right off the front of the university. They were thrilled. I was just happy this was over. So I move in to this kind of four-room basement which was already furnished. They said the last tenant cancelled last minute, and I only needed it for the three months of the summer, so he was giving us a fantastic deal. The first room was the main room, which consisted of a living room and a little table to eat. Immediately on the right of it was the kitchen and then the bathroom. The bedroom was on the left, and there was some kind of weird and small hall slash connection joining it to the living room. Since the start, I always felt kind of uneasy about the bedroom for some reason, and preferred to sleep in the living room, since there was already a comfy sofa bed in there, and there was no windows in the bedroom. Throughout the semester, I felt countless times that someone was watching me from that bedroom, when I was alone, watching TV, or playing video games. It was a weird and eerie feeling, to the point where I preferred closing the door leading to the bedroom altogether. I wasn't home that much, and sometimes I slept at a friend's, but every time I came back, it felt like I wasn't alone in that apartment, and there was never any sounds or sights. Just a strange feeling. I spoke of it to my friends and they laughed, since I was never the superstitious kind. So I kind of brushed it off the whole time, and thought nothing of it when I finished the semester. I just moved on with my life. About two years ago, one of my friends from college texted me. Hey, is the door number you lived at in that creepy basement back at uni 14? I was like, yeah, why? He then sent me a picture 
of an old local newspaper page. He had been through them at the library, looking for a picture of him back in his college football days. In it was the obituary section from 2009, the picture of a young and good-looking female student. Next to her picture was the picture of a door and a dress, which I recognised very well. She hung herself in her bedroom closet. When I was about seven, my two brothers and I were playing in an area that was used as an unofficial motocross place. We decided to dig a tunnel for some reason, being the extra smart guys we were. It took a few hours to dig about six feet in and two feet high. I was right up at the face when suddenly the tunnel collapsed. It was all dirt with no supports. The world went instantly black and hot, and I mean hot like a furnace. I couldn't move a muscle from all the weight of the soil completely enclosing me. I started to really panic as you do. Everything started turning red, which I guess was blood being forced into my head. Every breath was getting harder, as the soil constrained me more and more. Even though my hands were near my face, I couldn't move my arms to clear the dirt around my head, and also started breathing in dirt, which made me cough, which made me contract my stomach, and then I couldn't draw breath at all. This isn't what made me panic though. The total darkness turning red, with the incredible heat, made my young mind think I was going to hell. I don't know how long I was buried for, but it seemed like an eternity. Suddenly, I felt someone grab my feet. My brothers had been frantically digging through the collapse to pull me out, and managed to reach me and get me out of there. We never told my parents. I just went home and got hosed down. Last December, a little before Christmas, my friend and I arrived home after our final exam. There's a little red light at a major intersection up ahead, and I begin to slow down. I came to a complete stop in the right-slash-sidewalk lane of a four-lane street, two in each direction, facing southbound, with six cars in front of me and I'm stopped, with a side street to my right. Suddenly, I hear tyres screeching in a crash. I got hit, rear right of my car by another driver. We get out, exchange information, and begin to take pictures of our respective vehicles. I look up the street to make sure I have a few hundred metres between myself and any vehicles approaching from the north, before I step into the left southbound lane, so I can get a picture showing the angle of both of our cars and the street signs, which are rear right slash northwest intersection off the side street. My friend calls me over to unlock the trunk, so he can get his paperwork from his pack to write down his witness statement. And just as I step back into the right lane my car occupies, a northbound driver who was so occupied with observing our collision, drifts into the left southbound lane, which I just stood in, and misses me by about a foot. He was travelling at roughly 70 kilometres an hour. That's roughly 43 miles per hour. Two days later, I go paintballing with aforementioned friend and a few others. In between games, you go into the lobby with your mask off, and everyone is supposed to put their paintball marker gun on safe and have a barrel cover over the muzzle. I'm leaning against a wall in the lobby when a previous friend asks me if he can borrow money to buy more paint. My back is still leaning against the wall, but I lean to the right to hand him my wallet. As I put my hand there, I hear a loud splat against the wall I'm on. I look to find a paintball fired to where my head slash eyes would have been, had I not moved. Somehow, 
one of the kids across the room was putting his marker down on a table, and the barrel's cover retention bungee snapped, allowing the cover to fall off. The safety broke, and the marker fired around. A paintball in the eye at two hundred and fifty could have been a game changer, to say the least. Two days later, I'm out drinking with the friends I went paintballing with, and some others. We're walking down a major street, and I'm naturally a fast walker, so every twenty-five meters I'm stopping, turning back, and waiting for everyone to catch up. At one point, I look back and see everyone is still pretty far back, but it's cold and we're practically at our destination, so instead of stopping to wait, I decide to just keep walking ahead. Then, for some reason, I decide to stop. And shout back to them that I'll meet them inside. Just as I do so, I hear a loud engine roaring up the street, and turn to see a speeding Porsche, ten meters in front of me, hit the west wall of a building literally at a right angle, so hard that more than half of its engine compartment caved in, the airbags deployed, and the windows all shattered. Had I kept walking without saying anything to my friends, I probably would have been in between the car and the building. Two days later, it's Boxing Day morning, and I was out a few times throughout the night because I was excited to go pick up some items with my friends, the same one from the collision, because I was excited to go pick up some items with my friend, the same one from the collision slash paintball slash night out. At one point through the night, I have a nightmare of sorts. The earliest part of the dream I can remember is me leaping out of a panel door van with a rope in my hand. I have no idea why, but in the dream in my mind, I knew that someone was trying to kill me. As my feet hit the ground, I find myself in my driveway. I run inside the house, and for some reason, tie the rope to the front door's doorknob. Knowing that on the other end of the rope, the killer is tied to it, I lock and barricade all the doors and windows, and call nine one one. The operator tells me every officer is busy with something, and no one can help me. I hang up the phone. I'm about to call someone else, when I notice the rope has been cut. Trying to stay silent and listen for the killer, I suddenly notice. That everything that can possibly make a sound in the house is given a kettle, stove, fan, toilet, shower, TV, radio, everything. I look up at the top of the stairs and see someone's foot hit the first step, and start walking down the stairs. I wake up screaming and sweating, and the first words out of my mouth before I can even think to process it as a dream, a slender man. This actually happened a little less than a month ago. It was two a.m. and I was bored, so I went out to this park a bit out of town to go biking. It's for the most part surrounded by trees at all ends, with a running slash biking track that goes around the park. The park was lined with streetlights throughout, so you could vaguely see. I'd been going there for a few times that week. Around that time, because it unwinded me, and it felt good to be outside. But this time, when I was making my rounds, I see four six-year-old-looking figures coming out the forest. It was between four to seven of them, but these little things didn't have any parents with them, and they all just seemingly stayed silhouetted. I was kind of biking in their general direction, and they started coming at me. Thankfully, I was around two hundred feet away from them, but I could make them out, and the spooky little kids were coming. I don't think I've biked faster in my entire life. I literally became Lance Armstrong with an extra testicle for a good three minutes. It was unexplainable. I've been alone. I haven't seen a single person all the times I went, and I haven't gone since. Needless to say, 
When I was roughly eleven or twelve, our family cat, that we had had for a really long time, was somewhat sick. Not really sick, I guess, just obviously getting a little too old, and was clearly not going to live much longer. This cat was a big deal in my family. My dad loved this guy to death, and was so close with him. His name was Mac. And he was black with white paws and a white chin and belly, and he would apparently sit outside my door when I was a baby while I napped, and wouldn't let any visitors come into the room. Once I was old enough, he would let me sleep in my bed where I napped. He slept with my dad probably just about every night, for the fifteen years or so we had him, very close with the family basically. I ended up going to a birthday party one night, when Mac wasn't doing well. It was a sleepover at a hotel, and all my friends were going, so I felt as if I couldn't miss it. I had recently gotten this little rubber black cat from the dentist, as my dentist had a box of cheap toys and candy that you could pick something out of after your appointment. I got the toy because it reminded me of Mac. And he was sick at the time, so I thought I should take it to the sleepover with me, since I was leaving him for the night. Well, me being the stupid kid I was, I took it with me, and played with it in the pool and all over the hotel. Easily could have lost it, but I was pretty sure I still had it by the end of the night, and had put it back in my bag before going to sleep. The next morning I woke up. And got a call from my parents on my friend's parents' cell phone. I asked them how Mac was doing, and they sadly told me he had passed away the night before. I was extremely sad, and the rest of the kids tried to comfort me, as well as eleven-year-olds can. And I ended up going home with my other friend at the party, as my parents were working on something by then, and couldn't pick me up. When I got to the house, I looked in my bag for my toy, since I was super sad and wanted something comforting, and couldn't find the thing anywhere. I emptied the whole bag, which had a total of about five items in it, and it was gone. I cried because I knew I must have left it at the hotel somewhere, and was not going to get it back. Obviously, not a huge deal. But my cat just died, and the toy that looked like him was gone too. So too much for an eleven-year-old me to handle. I went home later in the day, and forgot to unpack my bag. When I went to sleep that night, I had this really strangely realistic dream that I was sitting in my living room with my dad, and Mac just strolls into the room like cats do. My dad said something like. Mac, you came back, and was really happy and petting him, and I was so confused how it was happening. When I woke up, I had a weird feeling that just seemed to be telling me to get up, and to walk into my parents' room. I walked in there, and my little black toy cat was sitting right on my mother's dresser. I was like, wow, super weird that I had just had that dream. And then found this again right after. I wonder where my mum found it. When I asked her about it, assuming that she maybe unpacked my bag and found it in there somehow, she had no idea what I was talking about, and didn't even recognise the toy. She said she hadn't unpacked my bag yet. So not that scary. More kind of cute. I still do have the toy at home though. Although I'm not exactly sure where, but I couldn't throw it away, because coincidence or not, I always saw it as a goodbye to me from Mac, since I wasn't there to say goodbye. This happened when I was a teenager, around fourteen or fifteen in high school. I had a boyfriend at the time who lived a fairly short walk from the school. And we would often walk to his place after school ended, 
and hang out for a few hours before I went home. Because we took the same route so often, I knew all the houses and landmarks on the way. In January, I live in the north so the winters can be pretty cold and snowy, my boyfriend and I started to notice a car that had been parked in the same spot for quite a while. We thought nothing of it at the time. Maybe the car had died in the cold and whoever owned it couldn't afford to have it repaired. But as spring came and the snow melted, the car was still there parked in the same spot at the end of my boyfriend's street. We passed it almost every day as we walked there after school. And as the days grew warmer, a rotten stench started to rise from the car. I joked to my boyfriend, I bet there's a body in the trunk. And we laughed it off. But we were curious. So one day, we peered inside the car's windows as we passed. The car was messy but not filled with trash or food. A discarded backpack lay across the seat, and papers were strewn here and there. It looked just like an ordinary car, except we knew that it hadn't moved for months, and the smell was indescribable. This smell continued to get worse as the spring turned to summer. One day, when I couldn't come over for some reason, my boyfriend and his dad decided to investigate the car. They found the doors were unlocked and the keys were inside the car. That was pretty strange. They went around the back and popped open the trunk. My boyfriend told me that a swarm of black flies flew up from inside. The smell was definitely coming from the trunk. Inside were a bunch of black garbage bags my boyfriend and his dad called the cops at this point. The cops later told us that inside those bags was rotting meat, cut into pieces. The first pieces of meat they tested belonged to a pig. But a few weeks later, my boyfriend's dad got another call. Under the pig meat were the bones of a human child. Whoever left that car sitting unlocked with the keys inside was obviously hoping the car would be stolen. It still gives me the shivers. This story is from a few years ago, probably 2009 or 10. I was in college and I used to drive a little manual two door. It had a back seat, but if you were over five foot six, it was basically impossible to sit comfortably. I was walking out of a big box store one night, and there's this disheveled woman in hysterics outside. She's claiming that her boyfriend took her paycheck to go get high, and now she can't get home. Well, where's home, I asked. She answered that it was a town that was probably 20 minutes away, but for me, it wasn't that far out of the way to help a random crying lady. During the car ride, she acts more and more fidgety and tells me about her history of drug abuse and her abusive druggy boyfriend and how she probably won't be able to pay rent and everything like that. Meanwhile, we're driving out to a more and more secluded part of town and the drive is taking longer and longer. About halfway through the drive, she mentions that she also has a host of mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar. And now I'm beginning to wonder about the truth to her story. But whatever, that explains the fidgeting. If she's just got done with a panic attack, adrenaline and whatnot. Finally, after 40 minutes of driving, we reach a house with no lights and no cars there, as she told me she lived with her kids and her mum. And she starts to fumble around and hand me money for gas. I told her not to worry about it, because my mileage is fine, and she needs to pay for her rent. She hesitated then, and I'm not sure if she hesitated because I was not accepting the money, or if she was thinking of doing something else. 
but I was alone in the middle of nowhere near an empty house. I turned my GPS on with my directions to home to indicate I was leaving. Pretty quickly, she got out of the car, went into a completely different direction away from the empty house and into the woods. I never saw her again, and I'm not sure if she was just scared or if she was trying to lure me out into the middle of nowhere for whatever reason. A part of me hopes she was really just coming down from a panic attack after getting left in a parking lot by her abusive druggy boyfriend and that she was just jittery because of that. But while it was happening, I definitely started getting a feeling that something was not right. I thought about it before, and considered that my manual transmission, my GPS having phone, which is less common in a college town in 2010, as most of my friends still had flip phones, or something else changed her mind about doing anything weird to me too if she was considering it. But hey, at least it was a relatively happy ending there. This happened when I was seven years old, and it has stuck with me throughout my life. The only people I've ever told was a girlfriend years ago, and another friend who I no longer speak to. Other than those two, I've kept this encounter private for obvious reasons. I was playing a game with my father and sister in the living room of our home. My grandmother was there too, sitting and watching. The game was that my father would lay on his back, lift his feet and tuck them into a squat so my sister or myself could sit down on his feet and he'd push us off and we would leap into the air and land on our feet, laughing. I remember giggling hysterically and saying, higher, and so he pushed off harder, and I must have lost control and went higher into the air, and came down wrong side up and smacked onto my head. It shook the house. My grandmother was upset, and I stood there as everyone got to their feet and surrounded me. It was in that moment when you're shocked and not going to cry, but it hurt, and you're stunned, before you realise what happened and finally started crying. It ended up being a concussion. My father was told not to let me sleep and to watch me closely. My head, in the weeks that followed, swelled out like a big egg. But it was in that moment right after the impact and before the crying, over on the table next to the sofa were standing two little blue men, no more than ten inches in height. They seemed to stand tall, or rather proud, like warriors. Their legs and arms were thin. I could see their mild knobs of knees and elbows. There wasn't much fat on them. They were both very lean and I could make out a slight muscle tone too on their bare chest and arms. They were both wearing grass skirts, like something you'd see out of primitive native tribes, but the grass seemed wet, like seaweed, and had a bit of a soppy squish lake bed look about it. One of the men was wearing a hat, like an old style cap, darker red in colour, almost like wine coloured. The other one I could see his hair more clearly and was long and unkept, with pieces coming down his face and over his ears. The one without the hat was holding a long spear in his hand. The base of the spear was resting on the ground and the pole came up to almost his full height with a pointy stone carved at the top. It was a fast momentary image and the scene in the living room quickly turned to panic after I hit the floor and my family crowded around me. And once I began to cry, I never saw the two little men again. But I never forgot that image. It felt like they had been there longer than just the short moment when I could see them with my eyes. And there was something sinister feeling about the way they confidently stood there and stared at me. It was clear that they were not afraid of me 
or the fact that I could see them. At the age of seven, as this was in the eighties, all I could compare them to were like evil Smurfs. The one's red cap even reminded me of Papa Smurf, but they weren't shaped like Smurfs, and that's where the comparison fell short. I've always been good at drawing, and at one point a few years later, I tried to draw them because I was afraid I might forget what they looked like and their details. I'm not really sure what happened to that drawing. On a final note, warp ahead to the early 2000s. I started googling it to try and find more info on the little blue men. I uncovered a picture of a painting from hundreds of years ago. It looked like an illustration of a book or something, on some academic website. Little blue men tearing apart a library and causing mayhem. I think it was called. The blue men, or something like that, in red caps, and they had the same stature and build. They were so strikingly similar to what I saw that that's when I actually had the nerve to tell the story to one of my friends. Since then, I've never been able to find that picture online again. All I ever find now are the blue man group and other unrelated things. I get the feeling that they don't want to be found. Has anyone else ever seen anything like this? Ever since I can remember, my mother has suffered from explosive anger episodes. Not a day went by without her blowing up at my father or me. As my father spent most of his time at work, I typically took the brunt of her rage. It often became so intense. That the noise would set off the dogs barking. As a child, what I could never understand was how my mother could act so resentful one moment, and then at the same time show so much affection. From ages three to ten, my mother would regularly show her love by coaxing me to suck her breasts and lean my face against her belly or mon pubis. I can still recall the salty, humid scent, and it makes my insides liquefy. Every day she insisted on dressing me, keeping me in bed with her each night, and soothing my genitals and anus with a cream, even when I assured her I wasn't sore. I wondered if her comments about my developing breasts and an abnormally large size of certain lower parts. Will ever really lose their impact. My mother is also a very primal person, taking to biting our female dogs' ears, to, as my mother puts it, asserting her role as the alpha female. After one particularly nasty fight following a school recommended appointment with a counselor for chronic stomach aches, my father scolded me for embarrassing the family. In disclosing clinical names of the female genitalia with the male therapist, evidently, the most concerning aspect of my use of these terms was the fact that I used the word "clit," something that the counselor had found odd for a six-year-old to know, given that the sole purpose of it is for pleasure. When my father approached me about my inappropriate behaviour, I was sitting naked in a bathtub. That was the only time I tried to tell my father what was going on, and he walked out on me, stating that my mother was the best mother anyone could ask for. After all, all mothers are surely nurturing and incapable of any nefarious activity. It was the night that my parents began to stealthily make love beside me in bed, that I finally put my foot down and requested to sleep in my own room. Several years later. When I was about eleven, I had retired to bed after a day of my mother giving me the cold shoulder after a blow-up. Evidently, I had forgotten to lock my bedroom door, and someone crept in. I could see my mother's outline against the light from the window. She made her way to the bedside, leaned down, and proceeded to lick me all over my face and neck. I remained paralyzed. 
until finally the moist onslaught stopped and I assumed she retreated. Though I didn't recall her leaving my room, in the morning she was gone. Now that I'm an adult, I keep as much distance as possible from my parents. Even during our last family vacation, following my college graduation, she barged into the bathroom while I was changing and commented on how I was growing a nice bush. Not like the hookers who always shave down there, she said. I moved out and into my own apartment not long after. Fortunately, as far as I can tell, my parents treat my much younger sister in a very normal fashion. Even on the rare occasion that I do visit to spend time with my younger sister, I make sure never to sleep under the same roof as my mother. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Like I said at the start, a huge thank you to each and every one of my patrons, who can be seen on screen. Your help is invaluable. It basically means that you pledge a small amount of money every month to help me with the channel and keep everything running smoothly. Of course, there's no obligation to do so, but if you want to chip in as little as $1, feel free to check out the link. Or don't, it's fine either way. But thank you, seriously, to all the patrons. If you liked the video, I would seriously appreciate it if you could drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. They always help and go a very long way. Something else that you could do, especially if you're new here, is subscribe and hit the little bell icon in order not to miss those nightly spooks. I'm considering doing another theme week, so perhaps... The week after next? Maybe even this week? I'm not sure yet. So yeah, theme weeks. I really enjoyed doing them before. I don't do them all that often. Um, maybe some wood? Wood-themed weeks? Maybe cryptid week? I'm not sure. I, 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 those are the ones I've done before, but I can probably come up with a few other themes. So I'm going to have a look around, and you'll see it in a poll soon. Because I think it would just be something really fun to put together. But anyway, if there's a story you want to share, feel free to send it to my email or drop it to my Reddit. But with that being said, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.